And now I'd like to introduce um, Stephen Packard, who has a few words of introduction before we get into the meat of this of this presentation. Great. So in this section, uh, Eriko Kojima and I interview 20 people who are saving the planet's biodiversity locally. Our principal audience is ecosystem restoration stewards or people interested in being stewards. But it's not about how to control invasive pests or how to identify a rare sedge. It's about building community, about wonderful people getting along well with each other. Decades ago, stewards were typically one lead volunteer per site. Over time, some stewards groups have grown into multi-leader lasting communities respected by neighbors, professionals, and local government officials. How big an influence could we become? How much impact on how wide a set of issues could we have? How large a constituency could we be? For that matter, how many good friends might, you, might each of us gain? Currently, we ecosystem conservationists are fewer than, say, people involved in scouts or little league or bowling leagues, for that matter, or burning, uh, birding. We believe the planet could use a lot more of us, people saving the life of the Earth's ecosystems. And the work is so engaging and rewarding that there's no reason it shouldn't grow exponentially. As we successfully welcome new people and mentor and empower leaders, Erico asks us to think about what is our secret sauce in this? How do we best develop new approaches to volunteering and community building? So for this, interview, we'll interview folks from four rich sites, Psalm Woods and Prairie, Nechusa Grasslands, Langham Island, and Deer Grove. After the interviews and in chats, we can discuss others. So Brandon, let's go to Erico and the video. Hi, I'm just going to introduce myself. I'm Erico Kojima. I'm a, a stewardship volunteer in, at the Cook County Forest Preserves dis, uh, Districts and Friends of Illinois Nature Preserves and many other places. Um, so we're just going to go straight to the videos. Thanks. Anybody want to jump in? I want to hear some personal stories with a lot of details. <laughs> Erico, you had mentioned something um at one point over the summer that stuck in my head or and maybe you've mentioned it again but it was like you know it's it's come up in conversation a couple of times but it was about um it was something about you know like the the impact that we can have on the on the um ecosystem is is basically limited um mostly by the number of leaders we have and um and i think when you said that like and i heard that for the first time that that was a really big motivator to be a leader because or to 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 take on more responsibility because it was it put the role of leader in perspective about like what does that actually mean it's not just about um having having this responsibility it's about maximizing um uh like a um, ecological impact so um and and when it look when you look at it from that perspective, it becomes like like an exciting imperative almost. Well, one thing I think that is good is that the the Cook County Forest Preserve and maybe it was Friends of the Forest Preserve where it was Cook County Forest Preserve District, um, but there was that path to stewardship program, um, and it was pretty easy and it seemed like everyone was encouraged to come and participate in getting your burn boss certification and getting your invasives identification. Um, and so that was really helpful and encouraging and kind of set the idea that that was what we were all gonna do. I think like all it takes to be a leader is sort of like a commitment to being like sort of reliable on like one small little thing. <laughs> like it doesn't have to be a big task or a big role. Um, you just sort of have to like carve out your niche and say like, you know, this is this is what you can count on me to do and I will do it reliably every time and I'll do it well and I'll be passionate about it. I think what you, that makes it a lot easier to take mm -hmm. on responsibility because we do have a pretty big group and 
the barrier to entry is low. You know, you don't have to go from zero to memorizing every single plant in the forest preserve. You go from showing up to, hey, could you lead the opening circle and lead people out to the site? Okay, or I've seen that done. I know how to do that. I can do that today. Or, hey, could you gather the tools because I'm going to have a tight schedule in the morning? Okay, yeah, I've seen that done. I can know what tools to bring. Um, and you just get like little pieces that you can help with. And pretty soon you've learned to do most of the things that you need to lead a work day or to pick seed or process seed. And um, and you have a really good team behind you to either mentor you in the way or to like all help out and work on it together. So it's not as intimidating. Doing this work like brings me the most fulfillment with like actually um, working with the land and working with the plants that I know and um, helping conserve them and restore the ones that need, need our help the most. Um, and I think it's also what really motivates me is like putting all these like it's it's sort of a big puzzle and we're trying to like you know solve the puzzle of where do all these species live where do they like to grow um what are each of their individual needs and how do we like yeah put them all back together in the right way um as we're doing this you know big restoration work um so getting to learn each of the plants like a little bit more every time you pick their seeds or like think about what seed mix they go into um is really yeah, the best way to like practice what I know as as an ecologist and as a botanist. I mean, um, yeah, there's like a lot of bureaucracy and like, you know, <laughs> doing work and like doing like corporate restoration. So um, being able to do this like as a, a volunteer and have the freedom to kind of learn and experiment um, and and do this hands on um, is really special. Well I, I personally feel that for me, this volunteering at SOM has been like life changing. And I, I look across the screen at all of you and I feel like maybe you all kind of feel like that too. I Tell me something about that. How has this changed your life? Who would like to go first? <laughs> maybe um, <tonight. laughs> it's made me feel healthier. I mean, I, I got a feeling if I didn't do this work, I'd probably be about 10 or 15 pounds heavier. Uh, not so much energetic, you know, it, it really brings you to life. You get out there and work and you're sore the next morning, but hey, you, you feel good about it. Yeah, actually by training, I was doing something else. Uh, what were you doing before? Well, I was a scientist at, uh, you know, doing some theoretical work, but I think Having seen this, I decided that, you know, this is what I want to dedicate my life to. And even though it meant, you know, that I would no longer be earning, I thought, you know, it's it's worth it. So I decided to just take early retirement and just, you know, do restoration work. So I it was life changing for me, but it took me a while to, to reach that point, a couple of years down the road before I could actually take the decision, but it was, inspired by you know what's going on here and it it was it was a very involved work it was there was science in it there was dedication in it there was various things involved and of course the beauty of nature and and restoring it so you know, all that made me decide that this is what is worth doing with the rest of my life i i feel as though um it's changed my life, I guess, in the uh, in the sense that my brain is constantly working. Like I'm constantly thinking about this, even after I um, leave a site. Um, and so, like, I, I feel as though um, since I started volunteering, I, I'm constantly uh, like, like my brain is constantly working on something that I, that we were just working on, or it's trying to figure out, um, uh, trying to figure out an answer to some problem we encountered, like over the last week or some something unusual that stood out. Um, there's just like it's like every single time I go out. Um, there's a new puzzle to be solved um, that presents itself somehow. And, um, and so um, 
I don't know. It's it's really like propulsive work mentally, um, and it sort of lingers with me. So I even I think that that's a life changing thing. I think that type of thinking. Yeah. To sort of follow up, um, I I agree with Rebecca, and I feel the same way about this work. I'm like constantly thinking about it, and knowing that I have a like-minded community of people to like and engage with this whole process like with is is really fantastic um and i guess to like put a little more detail to that like rebecca and i you know i was thinking about okay. the prairie and i was thinking about the tiny mammals that might be like under this like two and a half feet of snow that we have and the fact that i was able to say like hey rebecca i'm thinking about those the little mammals again at the prairie are you are you thinking about them too and she said yeah and like to have another person who's willing to like go out in this deep snow and like search for voles and signs of animal tracks is, is really amazing and the yeah. subject of having a community that you can share that kind of joy with um something that happens to me kind of often is when especially when there's fresh snow um, we go out to the woods and the snow is just unbroken. Nobody else has been out there. And so I go out trudging along, seeing what there is to see. Um, and eventually, almost invariably, Jim Hensel finds me. And he always says that he follows the tracks because there's nobody else but us. No one else but us would be out on a ridiculous day like this in two feet of snow trudging around the woods. So he knew it had to be one of his friends. And so he followed the tracks and lo and behold, there I was sitting by Fifth Pond. And then he'd heard about an owl nest or something. And we went tromping off to try to find it and see if we could identify what kind of nest it was. Also, my elder brother from India, when he visited and he saw all this going on, amazed by so many people who are just coming and serving nature, uh, many of them maybe not knowing too much about it, but they all have this urge to you know, restore nature, to, to do something for nature. And there is this wellspring of, you know, goodwill and, and wanting to do something for nature. And, and this is, I think, extraordinary, I think, uh, in these times when, when we have destroyed most of it, to find a good part of humanity wanting to restore and wanting to do something, uh, you know, to, to, to kind of ameliorate. And all this, the forest preserves and the North Branch and, and the Soam Preserves community, they're providing a wonderful opportunity to, you know, as an outlet to channelize this, uh, this goodwill to do something for nature into actually achieving it. And I think I see this as a very extraordinary thing that's taking place before my eyes. I mean, I think I'm with Sai in that the biggest thing it's done for me is give me a what I think is my plan for my future. Um, you know, I am from Wisconsin and I have thought about going back and maybe I want to go move out to the country and I love camping. And, you know, I've had a sense of restlessness. Um, but since I've been a steward at Fifth Pond, it's very clear to me that, no, this is this is my plan. This is what I want to dedicate myself to. And I am not moving away from some woods because it has become so precious to me. It's almost sacred, that little spot by the pond. And it gives me a sense of grounding and purpose. And I hope I can't quite take early retirement, but um, I hope that I'll maybe go part-time. And right now I do other things during the week and two days of the weekend, I'm a forest preserve steward. And I hope in the coming years to slowly shift the balance and be maybe three days a forest preserve steward and work my way towards retirement. Um, but it really feels like I have a clear sense of purpose and a clear sense of, okay, this is it. This is the plan. I'm going to spend my time working on this beautiful place. And it's a, it's a good feeling. the strength of the Machusa community. I think it's gotta be uh, excitement about a, a vision for the project and a, and a dedication to really doing it right. And so people do a lot of research on their own. They do above and beyond what they can to support the mission. And 
because we're all empowered to take such action, it's really, a, it's a dynamic place. And you can be as big as far as restoration as you want to be. You can do as much as you can bear. Uh, there really are no limits. And I think it's part of the environment and part of the kind of people who like that independence that that environment attracts. And I love that there's so many different people from different walks of life that bring a lot of different skills to the project and they're willing to volunteer um, just their know-how, whether it's from you know, what they do in their real life or their hobbies. It's just, um, I'm always very motivated by the, how, um, it, things take off at a quick pace. You're not, you know, something's talked about and it doesn't sit long on the table. It's just, it's active on it. And I get so excited. I'm like, wow, you know, Bill just did this. And it's like, wow, I'm now motivated to do this. And so it's, it's wonderful in that way. We kind of um, encourage one another. They pointed out that everyone comes from a different part background and they have different skills and, and the key to tap the key is to tapping into those skills and making them feel as important as they can so if one's got mechanical skills and they want to work on the chainsaws and take care of the equipment uh, i'll pull them off and and let them do that and if if they don't have the passion for restoration itself they may have the passion just to be a part of something bigger than themselves and this is a group that uh, finds rare seeds and knows how to burn places, but also built the barn with the offices and it's become and a conference center, et cetera. There's so many different components. We brought vice in here and volunteers are a big part of that the whole way through building the fence, the corral, visiting sites, staff and volunteers traveling together out of state, doing the roundups sleeping in the noisy cabins with snoring males mostly. And uh, yeah, all that stuff we did. We do together, we come up with these ideas like VSAN and then we do crazy things. And here's a question, uh, Dee, Bernie uh, alerted me that uh, you've had some success with using signs along the trails to promote or recruit volunteerism, is that so? Uh, yes, actually, um, I can't be credited with that idea. That was actually, um, I think Mike Carr, one of our um, stewards came up with that idea. But then I had, you know, like the graphic design skills to kind of put that together. And, and it has brought in um, some more volunteers. It was a, a new approach that someone had an idea to try, and I, I think it's been uh, pretty successful. Uh, Bernie, you've had uh, some success using uh, Sign Up Genius software to help with uh, coordination with volunteers. Is that right? That, that's right, Steve. We used to have a situation where you would show up for a work day and you wouldn't know whether you would have one volunteer or maybe 20 or 25, and it was kind of harrowing to prepare for. Um, so partly due to COVID, but we went up with a sign up genius, genius. In my case, I like about six volunteers to work with in this environment and uh, folks sign up and we have had amazing uh, attendance. We probably have 95% of people who sign up show up. And I think it helps them feel more important about what they're gonna do we have their name, we can welcome them to the site and we can follow up with a photograph of the stuff we did and encouragement to come back for another day. So it's really taken some of the stress out of leading work days. And I'm real, I'm real pumped up about it. I'm thinking maybe in the future to get the volunteers to maybe stay with one area, well, like a, a volunteer to stay with one property and let them lead up the volunteers in that area, then we can move on to another area and then just go back and forth. So have somebody there that knows what's going on in that site all the time. That's gonna be hard to do. Randy's thinking strategically, I like that. Uh, Bill, Bernie, D, other thoughts? I would just observe that the MRCP is not 
totally unlike the new organization Friends of the Illinois Nature Preserves, yeah. in that we are really advocating for preserves in a two county area. And, and Randy's vision is very much like yours that each, pres each reserve would have a uh, people that care, people that love it. Yeah. And, and I think that's the way it'll be successful, but for extremely small reserves, preserves, I don't know how you keep up the camaraderie. You know, you, to me, it's part of it's part of a mission, and and I don't know exactly how you do that, but it, it's not impossible. It's it's difficult, Bernie, because with all the volunteers, you have to get to know each one of the volunteers pretty personally and keep up that, you know, that friendship between every one of them. Um, yourself and that volunteer, if you're the leader of the, the volunteers, but each one of them develop friendships among each other, but you have to stay in touch with them. And like right now it's winter time, we're snowed in, can't do anything too much, but I need to be on the internet actually, and or calling them, telephoning them if they don't like to text, just to stay in touch with what's going on in their lives, because that's important to them as well. Uh, because when you go to call them back in the spring and say, well, I haven't heard something from you in three months where you've been, you know, it's kind of awkward. Yeah. I could see us having uh, unit stewards for the different properties that MRC gets involved with. And we could also have roaming crews that like to do brushwork together. Certainly the fire crew is that way. We go to site to site and we want to support as many sites as we can, whoever owns them to get fire on the ground. I bribe everybody to come. I say, bring a friend. I bring food, drink, <laughs> just to get them to show up. And then uh, I've, I've gotten some good volunteers that stuck around because of that, so. Um, maybe we could kick it off then with Molly. Molly, tell us uh, about you know you've you've come uh, many times already. Probably probably you, you can't even count how many times. You've come. <laughs> I, I want to kind of hear your story about you know what inspired you to come um, the first time, and then what inspired you to keep coming, and what you have for like hopes for the future. For Langham Island, you know, stuff like that. Anything that comes to mind, it'd be great if you could share that. Yeah, sure. So I, just as like my hobby interest, I'm very into nature kind of things, like being in the woods. I like bird watching, all of that good stuff. Um, and I'd also had um, actually like a work study job as a student when I was still in school that was exactly the same kind of work as we do on Langham. Um, just clearing honeysuckle and buckthorn, basically. Um, so I'd always known I liked that kind of work. And when I found out that Langham was looking for volunteers, I was excited to get back into doing that kind of work. Um, I like that it's very local to our community. So we live in Kankakee. There's a flower named after us. I didn't even know that till I was an adult, even though I lived in Kankakee all my life. Um, so if I could be involved in helping that project, I just wanted to be. So yeah, it's right. very fun. Um, hopes for the future. I would love to see the island return to the Oak Savannah. It would be cool if there wasn't honeysuckle everywhere and you could see through the tree cover through to the other side of the island. So that's my hope for the future. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's a long-term picture, that's for sure. And we started years ago and I came to some of those work days and we made some progress, but we made so much progress in this last year. It's really exciting because sometimes it was one step forward, two steps forward, one step back. Now I feel like it's about five steps forward. And of course, when things start blooming and it might be a step back too, we'll see the honeysuckle won't go away again, but we have to keep, keep on it. The um, follow-up will be a big, big thing to keep doing, but and we, we can see changes, so that's the exciting part about it. Um, you know, every, it's nice to have a lot of helping hands, too, when we have just have one or two people or three people. It's, it's tough, but we had some great turnout at our work days, so. So I learned about Langham Island 
when I was a lot younger visiting the uh, state parks with family and friends, but I'd never actually seen the uh, the kinky uh, mallow, the flower that bloomed there. But it's you know it's a very unique piece of kinky history, and it's a way to hold on to the past. In a way, a lot has changed with the river. I grew up around Kinky, you know, I was born at Riverside on the river. And I've always felt that the river had a unique story. And, you know, Langham Island is definitely a part of that story. And, you know, so obviously I want to preserve that and enrich it for the future. I've started coming with my daughter and she really enjoys it. You know, normally she likes being out in nature, but we haven't quite found, you know, something that she you know, suited her interest as well as what her, as well as she liked, you know, she likes hiking, but whenever we go out to Langham Island, you know, she's, she's ready to go. She really loves it. She loves going out there and doing the work and, you know, the idea of saving this flower. So it's really been an enriching experience for us. I just felt really wildly fortunate to kind of fall into being the volunteer site coordinator for Langham and um, also felt really like intimidated by that task because it is such a precious site um, and all of the nature preserves are precious but I, I do think there's something really special about Langham um, and the mallow is certainly part of that but I think I just found it really heartening to see how quickly a very capable like group of people um, kind of assembled and like took charge and is like really interested and committed to it. And um, yeah, I think that has been really like rewarding for me and, and just makes it really fun to show up to. It's fantastic working with volunteers at, at Langham Island. Um, it, it, it's kind of opened my eyes to a, a new tool to use for, for nature preserves. There's such a dedicated group of volunteers here that have transformed the island. Um, DNR has roughly 50% um, of the acres of nature preserves throughout the state. There's around, uh, right around 600 sites in our nature preserve system. Um, and DNR owns roughly half of that. So um, with limited staffing and limited funds, it is impossible for DNR to steward all of its properties um, and, and nature preserves how they how they deserve um, to be stewarded and, and cared for and, and, and managed. Um, so to, to have volunteers step up and assume that the lead role in, in managing the site is, is fantastic. I wish every nature preserve throughout the state had a community of volunteers uh, to be our, our eyes and ears and, and boots on the ground helping with this. It's, it just, it seems like a really sustainable model uh, to take care of these really unique sites. We're, we were in one crew that was planting some of the seed mixes. So can you share with us about that experience. That was pretty fun. It was, you know, a very unique thing for my daughter to do. I definitely wanted to have get her to have like hands-on in terms of doing that directly, especially knowing that a lot of those seeds are going to bloom. But you know, I felt like kind of an old school farmer, you know, throwing seed on the ground and, you know, walking around. It was pretty, it was pretty fun. But yeah, that was great. You know. I'm anxious to see how much of that seed germinates this year and if it will uh, help us carry a fire on the island. Right now, um, there's only small patches that burn where there's that oak leaf litter and a little bit of native grasses, but um, you guys have really uh, seeded a, a, a large portion of the island. I'm, I'm hoping that um, with the fires will just be, uh, you know, just able to burn a lot more than we have in the past. I'm looking forward to Langham being an oak savanna again, and especially on that western slope, seeing grasses come up so we can burn that. And I think when the Western Slope has a mallow, a flowering mallow on it, I think will feel like a major accomplishment. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, that is one thing I want to do is get back and cage all those baby oaks so the beavers don't take them all. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you took charge. I mean, you one of the work days you went around and, and looked for the, the promising young oaks and put those cages on it. So how, how was that experience for you? 
It was fun. Um, I actually didn't really know that we had such active beavers on the river, even though we live on the river. So that was kind of surprising for me to see all the beaver stumps laying around. Um, it's nice to know, especially considering how long it does take oak trees to get even as big as they are, you know, just a little baby ones. Um, I understand the beavers need their <laughs> trees as well, but I want to save, you know, as many oaks as we can yeah. on the on the island to stay there for their habitat. So it was a nice feeling like you were protecting them pretty directly that way. <laughs> You know, I know a few things and somebody else next to me knows other things and we share it and uh, that's how we learn different plants and insects and birds and butterflies and then the whole works. So uh, I think just being outside with other people who are like minded and just being outside in general helps everyone feel good and that's a good reason to come out to the island. And people bring your guitar and your harmonica, <laughs> your ukulele. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there you go. Bench and bring his guitar. <laughs> Like a little camping trip too when we go out there <laughs> start a fire no camping allowed in nature preserves <laughs> <laughs> there is camping allowed at the state park so that's not right. <laughs> there you go do you have anything you want to say about why people should come out um if you're like me and you have adhd it's a good thing <laughs> to pass your time <laughs> Yeah, it's, yeah. I think I agree with Ben. It helps the time out there flies. It's a very cool place. Yeah. Um, it's a very, the Langham Island is a unique site with unique plants, obviously, but I think at any of the nature preserves, it's a great excuse to get outside. Um, I like that it kind of helps me feel very connected to a source of local pride that's very tangible and real. You can see the island being cleared of the honeysuckle you see the native plants that are only found in Illinois. I think it's just a very, almost like a emotionally grounding experience as well that really connects you to the place that you live in. I like that about it a lot. It makes me feel proud of Illinois. <laughs> so I, I like that what John said, where we all kind of show up knowing pieces of things and then we share those things and, you know, slowly we're like doing what we know how to do and then seeing how the island responds and um, in that process, like learning how to, how to care for it. So yeah, I think that learning process is really fun. And I get just, a, just as much working with the volunteers here. Um, it, it's, it's inspiring. And uh, even though I work for the nature preserves and, and DNR, I don't, I don't know half the stuff that you guys know, you know, um, it's, it's just an open exchange of information and, and learning from each other. And it's, it really is inspiring. Um, like everyone else has said, it's been deeply rewarding to um, not only get to know like really neat people, the regulars that are showing up, um, but to see how much we can accomplish working together and this just a really fun collaborative process. So thanks to everybody that comes out and, and works at Langham. <laughs> Lots of good work is happening. I think we should hear from Sue and her seed knowledge is off the charts. And then we should hear from Anne regarding the weed scouts. Um, it's a good idea. What, uh, Sue, tell us about the seeds program uh, that uh, I think we <laughs> think of you as leading and what, what inspires people in that, what holds it together? Well, I, I, I guess I've, I've just kind of taken that on. What I like about our group is that as we've developed, I think people have just gravitated towards their special interests, their, their niche, niches or niches. And um, it, it really works well because then we can all, you know, learn from each other and, and depend on each other since we've got such a huge area to work on. Um, but I, I think it was just, you know, going out on the, the different uh, days with, with Daniel and you, Stephen and Linda and, and learning about these things, um, trying to figure out what all these plants are. And it was sort of 
this idea that you mean if we collect these seeds, we can then put them back out here and this will actually work. We'll get new plants. You know, I was somewhat skeptical. It just seemed like this is just too easy. And it's a time of the year that I especially like being out because most of our seed collecting ends up being later in the summer and in the fall. Um, and just being out there is absolutely glorious in the afternoons, um, the mornings, whenever we're there. And uh, I guess that's just kind of why I've, I've taken a shine to it and tried to learn more. Um, you know, I've gone to some other people's work days, which is something that I'd like to do more of because I find that's extremely valuable to learn um, from different stewards in the area. But um, yeah, it's, you know, when I think of it, it's like going from zero knowledge, nothing. I mean, my background's more in cell biology and now going into this and learning all these names and having to relearn them every spring. And, <laughs> you know, it's... Um, and you're saying you just collect seeds and throw them on the ground and a new ecosystem comes up and that's inspiring. Yeah, you, you know, you would think, yeah, it's like I sometimes I feel like Sally Fields. It works. It really works. It's fun. That's the best. And singing, right, Anne? Yeah, and singing, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I really enjoy um, growing into a seed scouting role where I can take, just take a stroll, take a walk in the woods, and it's such a treasure hunt just to find the seeds uh, to identify the plants and say, oh, but it's not quite ready yet, maybe one or two more weeks. And that sort of intel gathering is just a lot of fun for me. And Amanda suggested that we also think about a different kind of treasure hunt, weed scouting. <laughs> and how does that go? Well, how does that work? Well, I, I took the easier route where, where Sue had to learn all these thousands of plants, you know, the good plants. I, I started one at a time with the invasive plants and we, um, we developed a group of invasive plant monitors that we call weed scouts. And uh, we've um, given people, assigned them certain areas that they've come to own and feel a, a real kinship to. And they've, we teach them the the basic invasive plants to look for and what to do with them when they find them, you know, the garlic mustard, the sweet clover, and people take a real sense of ownership for their areas. It gets a little competitive. Um, I know my husband is a weed scout, and if I walk by his area and I find a garlic mustard, I pull it up, I take a photo, I send it to him, look what I found in your area, and then it's, you know, it's crazy, but uh, people love their areas and they're proud of it, and um, I think uh, we've developed a, a good group there and it's really helped our work days because mm -hmm. we know exactly where we're gonna head, head Saturday morning instead of you know wandering around looking for where we're gonna find garlic mustard or whatever we're working on. Uh, we know ahead of time and, and our work days are more effective that way. Pete, what's your perspective on how leadership patterns have changed over the decades? Well, now that's a good question for me because um, I sort of inherited the model, I guess I'd been presented by Dale, which was sort of a, a one leader model. Um, and, um, you know, we kind of started out that way when I got going. I had Ron Vargason help me, of course, and he was he was very helpful, but um, as far as planning and, and uh, Kind of the whole pit, the whole spectrum of things that needed to get done. It was mostly on my shoulders, but over time, I I tried to start bringing people in, and you know, with successes and failures at that, and trying to get more people involved in um, some of the leadership roles. But frankly, the Deer Grove East model was more successful at fostering uh, a variety of leaders, uh, such as these guys that I'm here with, and. Um, now they've kind of actually infiltrated into Deer Grove West. And so now we have these leadership resources all around me and it's, it's a great, a great uh, success, I think, to kind of pull the two pieces together. I feel that both sides of the road were, uh, you know, Deer Grove West being my main responsibility and Deer Grove East uh, were both 
really have been really successful um, separately, but they're much more powerful together. So I'm really, really happy with the, the direction we're taking right now. Uh, what's the best way to welcome? What inspires people? Well, I, I think um, just tossing out those little nuggets of learning and um, that, I mean, that's what gets me. And it's also, it, it is such a huge site and the people that live around there, you know, you're, you're on the bike trail or you're on one of the maintained trails, but you throw out the fact that we're going to walk off trail and it's like you're sharing a huge secret. Like people didn't realize they're even allowed to step off the paved bike, bike trail or something. And you give them the opportunity to go behind that chain link fence over in Deer Grove West where, where the, the ravines are. It's like you're entering another world and they're in on a big secret now. And that's, but a secret that we wanna share with a lot of people. I agree. That was one thing that hooked me right away was, was Mark and Pete and Ann and Sue all sprinkling out these little nature fun facts. And there's just these little nuggets. That's a great word. And um, things that are just easily accessible. And when you can combine that sort of quick little nugget um, of learning, plus this infectious faith, in the agency of volunteers to really be effective. You know, Mark, when you were teaching me about um, oh, multiflora roses, and when you said the invaders have hairy armpits, <laughs> and you handed me some pruners and just said, you know, go at it. That sort of easily accessible nature fun fact and empowerment and your faith in the, in the ability of volunteers to accomplish great things is just intoxicating. That's one of the first things that hooked me. And I think it's, it's the, the genuine enthusiasm, especially of people like Pete. I love going out on his work days because you're there to do the work. However, as you're walking down the path through the woods, he'll go, oh my gosh, look at that. Oh. Oh, I haven't seen that here before. And he gets so excited and he'll explain it. He'll give the history. And it's just like, wow, you know, just, yeah. Yeah, I think it's that enthusiasm that, that hooks me. It really you know, can talking... open our eyes, you know, especially yeah. if you have high school students or, or people who aren't accustomed to being out there and they're not even aware of all the wonders that are surrounding them. And to be able to point something out and, and open their eyes and have them see something that, that uh, in a way they never would have seen it before. It's, it's you know, Sue, just so fun. Sue, you were talking about the walk out to the workday and, and that makes me think, you know, that's actually one of the most important times, I think, of a workday. Yeah. Um, sometimes you get to the workday and you've got 15 people there and you know that 12 of them are experienced volunteers and you're just gung-ho to get out there and start doing something mm -hmm. but it's those couple of people that maybe are are new and i you know i'm the ambassador to the new folks or something i, I always tend to kind of fall back and i talk to them and um <laughs> I have my, my standard uh, speech, especially when we're over in East, I start talking about the restoration and the, the you know, um, mitigation plan. And, and I pretty much say the same thing all the time. And you can tell the more experienced volunteers peel off away from me because they don't <laughs> want to hear it again. <laughs> and I, on the way out to the work site, you know, we have a little chat and what's going on here and why we're doing it. And that can really be one of the most important parts of the work day, I think, that walk out there. Next question, how important to Deer Grove is a sense of community? The mission is fundamental, but there's also the sense of community. Um, who could talk a little about that? Well, I would just, I'll give a quick story, which it just blew my mind. It was just last week and, you know, the weather's been pretty rough pretty cold and we didn't have a lot of people out there, but Amanda was there and we had um, a volunteer who's not come out too often, Sarah Fallon, um, and she's a great photographer and came out for the first time. And I swear, Amanda and Sarah had a 30 minute conversation about hairstyling and blue hair. And it's like, it was like, <laughs> and it was just, it was just perfect because it was like, it was, 
you know, we enjoy the work, it's important, but really you're connecting with where people are at, what, what, their, what their concerns and interests are. And I think that's really, um, I, I think, and I, I remember you saying this, Stephen, you know, when you sometimes have kids out there and they get distracted and play around and it's like, well, that's okay. They, you, you, you want people to have fun. It's gotta be a fun experience. So I, I think that's part of the community that we've created is where, you know, you connect with people where they're at, you um, encourage them, but also just have fun too. I now know how to keep hair blue. <laughs> There you go. That's important. I came out to Chainsaw and I didn't expect to have a conversation about <laughs> hair care. <laughs> so there we are. There we go. But it is interesting that I guess when I started, I thought that that this type of volunteering might attract someone who's more in science or nature or different backgrounds related to that. And oh my goodness, it's just such a mix of people, which makes it so much more fun because they're bringing with them their stories and backgrounds and sharing. And I love oh, it's such that. a wonderful escape. Yeah. It, it's such a wonderful escape to uh, if somebody who has a desk job and then they show up and you give them a bosa and say, go cut down that buckthorn. That's not something that they get to do in their nine to five. Well, and that's something you have to consider when you're you're looking for volunteers. I think, um, you know, not not what you see in their background could help you. For for instance, in my day to day job, I write all day long, and any other volunteer opportunity I've I've gone to, they go, "Oh, you're a writer. Can you do our newsletter? Can you do our website?" Can you no, I don't want to do that. I do that all day long. I want to do some, I want to learn about something else. I want to do something else. So, you know, instead of figuring out what the person's background might be useful to you, to more find out what is of interest to them. I think that's a great point because, Anne, you said that other volunteer opportunities had tried to use those skills and you didn't end up staying with those volunteer opportunities. No, not so much. I don't want to do that. Yeah. But the way that we're able to, to connect with people and say, there's so many different areas to get involved here. What sparks your interest? Um, that's part of the strength of our community. One volunteer said to me, you're trying to get me to think. Let me tell you, I think all week long to make my living. <laughs> I come here not to think. I come here to be Absolutely. And, Absolutely. And yet other people say one of the most inspiring things about this is that you think of there, there's a puzzle that presents itself to you all the time and you spend your time. How do I solve that? How do these things fit together? You have a group of people show up. Everybody seems like they're clicking and a lot of work's getting done. Everybody's having fun. There's a lot of chatter going on, a lot of, um, you know, blue hair uh, recipes being exchanged and so on. Um, just the combination of being with people that are just awesome. I mean, it's, it's you know, it amazes me that, you know, I'm, I'm involved in like four or five different volunteer groups right now because I'm retired and um, all of the people in all the groups are wonderful. And it's, it, it, you really have to work hard to find somebody who you don't really want to spend time with. And Deer Grove is, uh, just a bunch of very wonderful people. And uh, that makes it really special to be able to be out in the woods or prairies or wetlands or wherever and uh, kind of stumbling along and uh, doing our work and uh, realizing that, you know, at the end of the day, we're actually getting some pretty significant work done. Feels good. Yeah, what could be better than, than being out with an enthusiastic group of people and in just the most gorgeous setting and stumbling across a, a patch of fringe gentian and we all go, we whoop it up and- <laughs> Well, you whoop it up. <laughs> <laughs> Scare off the young kids, you know. Yeah, it's right. like, what the heck? Good at that. But, um, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's the whole package. It really is just a wonderful way to spend your time. <laughs> So is it time to take questions? I mean, we've been taking them in the chat box, but uh, 
What have we got that we haven't addressed? Or anything that, Stephen, would you like to speak to anything that people have been commenting on? Well, I certainly do think it's an important challenge to us. We just love to think about uh, nature, ecosystems, what birds need, what rare plants need, how to do uh, fire, etc. And uh, we don't think as much about uh, how to improve our abilities with uh, organizing a very important a new component of our uh, culture. So um, I like reading everyone's comments and um, and if this is the question time, uh, well, uh, I will say that uh, one thing that um, people might be interested in is I do write a blog post, Strategies for Stewards, which I uh, put a lot of this stuff into, and I also will be doing some more after this because of the wonderful ideas stirred up by those 20 people. And so I'll put that, um, I'll put that address in the comments in case anyone would like to check out uh, some more of this as time goes on. And by all means, uh, send in comments there. Same thing with uh, Friends of Illinois Nature Preserves. We're trying to help organize these kinds of groups uh, at uh, probably of the 600 nature preserves, probably 400 dearly need them. And maybe there are 20 so far. So uh, there's great opportunities for anyone who would like to take some of this on. Um, Stephen talked about secret sauce and um, I, I, I feel like, you know, this, some people may be um, wondering, you know, how did these places get such excited, vibrant volunteers? And, and I personally, from my point of view of, of a person who didn't know anything about it and um, by, by lucky, uh, you know, serendipity, met somebody who told me about it and I came and I liked it and I kept coming. You know, I, I think I that was like, that was luck or, you know, who knows what. And, but there's, you know, so many people who live in our region, millions of people. And just in the Cook County Forest Preserve District alone, there's tens of thousands of acres. And, and there's such a need for stewardship and leaders. Um, uh, and I think, but Rebecca was talking about this, um, that we're limited by the number of people who who are willing to lead. And and I think that a lot of us are leaders, actually. We, a lot of these um, groups had, you know, many, many leaders and just a few of them are in this these panels. And um, and I think that one thing that I'm, I'm very obviously passionate about this, about you know, how, how can more and more volunteers um, find this and make this a way of life and and have have it be a life-changing thing where they just really get into it. And I think a lot of times um, it's it's very subtle. It, you, it's, it has to be almost like um, there are opportunities and there's mentoring and there's uh, more experienced people accompanying them, but then just like almost in a way, getting out of the way in some sense. You know, you don't leave people alone. You really accompany them in their path and you um, you do things together so that there's learning that happens and there's a, there's a whole culture of learning. So I'm always thinking about stuff like this. And I hope that, you know, people out there that are in the audience will help help me and others think about this. We have a Dan question. Asks, oops, someone else talking? Yeah, Dan we have asks about recommendations for recruiting new volunteers during pandemic times. Uh, yeah, be safe. Uh, wear masks. Uh, stay six feet, feet apart. But it's um, 
so much safer to be outside in the wind than it is to be somewhere else. And one new volunteer who came recently uh, said, during COVID, if you're not out here doing this, what are you doing? So uh, I think there are special opportunities during COVID. People are looking for a safe and fun, interesting, meaningful places to be outside. This is Brandon coming in. Um, I'm wondering, you know, I had the great pleasure to help record those videos over Zoom and, you know, was able to hear the full conversations. And I'm wondering for each of you, if there were any things, you know, things that were surprising or things that were really thought provoking that you took away from those conversations as we were working on them over the past couple of weeks. Well, one thing about the uh, recordings was um, people uh, have uh, people gravitate towards talking about the ecosystem, and uh, it was really challenging for us to try and focus on uh, what's our uh, what's the human dynamic in this. Uh, one of the uh, most impressive groups, the Poplar Creek group from, as Barbara Hill says in the chat, in, in its earliest days, divided the volunteer uh, team into two parts. The, um, uh, it was started, it was a wonderful start with a big uh, uh, launch event and Dr. Beth spoke at it and uh, um, the call went out, who would be interested in help organizing this event, uh, the, the stewardship here. And a dozen people volunteered on the first day. And uh, so some people already knew how to do controlled burns or how to cut brush or how to uh, gather seeds or in Barbara Hill's case, how to write a, an excellent uh, newsletter. Uh, but one person was um, uh, worked in a new high tech kind of company at uh, human put human relations or whatever it's called, and she started I think it was called the Human Potential Group, and that was uh, people who would welcome new people, people who would follow up with new people, people who would plan parties. It's important to have a party once in a while, uh, and the newsletter, etc. And having a, being in a group that has a human potential component, it's hard to beat. Erico, how about you? Any any surprising or takeaways or anything that's really stuck with you from these conversations? Yeah, um, I think that um, it's it's really. Um, inspiring i think that mark kluge was commenting in the chat box about how it's really to share in these stories to listen to each other's personal stories of what um deepens their inspiration and their passion and commitment is is really important for us as um you know ecological restoration stewards or um, volunteers stewardship volunteers and i hope we keep doing that and and sharing in these wonderful stories. It was great to get so many, so much feedback in the chat portion, especially at the final end of a six day conference, uh, a lot of challenging online uh, components. So um, uh, I look forward to more and better as we go ahead. Thank you both. And thank you to so many of you who were part of those conversations that Erico and Stephen recorded, who are with us today um, here, you know, commenting and adding your thoughts in the chat. There's a there's a whole sort of level of sort of learning and conversation that's going on. And know that we are capturing, you know, both both 
you know, the recordings, the original recordings, the recordings as presented in this panel in this afternoon, and then we are also um, capturing the chat to um, to to have. So, so you know, a lot of great layers and a lot of great community building here at Wild Things on this final day. <laughs>